All right, let's kick things off and talk about formula syntax, which is basically how formulas and functions are written and what components they contain to make them work. Now, in this demo, we're going to be looking at the match function. And don't worry about exactly what match is designed to do. We're going to cover this function in depth in the lookup and reference section of the course. For now, just pay attention to the way that it's written. And the first thing you'll probably notice is the function name. And that just tells Excel what type of operation you're about to perform, in this case, a match. And there are nearly 500 different functions in Excel, each designed to accomplish very specific, distinct tasks. A couple things to note here. For one, function names aren't actually case sensitive. I write mine in all caps. It helps me kind of differentiate between the function names and the rest of my formulas. Other people prefer lowercase. You know, it's really up to you. And second, function names actually aren't always required. If you're performing basic arithmetic, like addition, subtraction, division, or logical operations like greater than, less than, equal to, not equal to, those operators generally stand for themselves. You don't need a separate defined function to perform those types of operations. Now, following the function name come the arguments. And the arguments are function specific. They vary by function. And they're designed to provide Excel with any information needed to evaluate the proper result. So in this case, with our match function, we've got three arguments here, the lookup value, lookup array, and the match type. But only two of the three are actually required. Note that match type is surrounded by square brackets. That means it's an optional argument. So Excel will apply a default value for match type if we were to leave that third argument blank, but there are additional options there if we choose to use them. And while most functions, in fact the vast majority, will have at least one required argument, there actually are some that don't require a single argument at all. So functions like row or column, which return an attribute of a given cell, or today and now, which are volatile functions designed to return the current date or the current time, those don't require any argument. You just open and close your parentheses and you're good to go. And we're going to cover all four of those functions later in the course. So a couple things to keep in mind. You're always going to start your formulas with an equal sign. You're always going to surround your arguments with parentheses. And here's an important thing to keep in mind. In the example you're looking at here, and in the demos that I'm going to walk you through throughout the course, my arguments will be separated by commas. And you're having trouble following along and you're hitting all these uh, formula related errors in Excel. It may mean that you need to use a different list separator. And one of the most common alternatives to the comma is the semicolon. So that would be the first place that I'd look if you're having trouble following along. Now, pro tip here. As you begin writing your formula, Excel has a really helpful tool called Function Screen Tips. That's this box that pops up beneath the formula bar, and it will guide you through each individual argument in bold. And I've found this to be an extremely helpful tool, especially once you start writing more complex nested functions where it's very easy to lose your place. Let's jump into Excel. I want to walk you through three different examples of formulas that should hopefully help you wrap your head around basic formula syntax. All right, great. So here I am in Excel, and I'm on the first tab called formula syntax. If you'd like to follow along, make sure to head to the download where you'll find this file along with all of the other course resources. Now, what we're looking at here are different customers. We've got information about their name, their address, city, state, zip, their birthday, telephone number, and their email. Now, please keep in mind these aren't real people. These aren't real phone numbers, so I would encourage you uh, not to reach out and try to contact these people. So I've also included three columns here for birth year, area code, and username, which we're going to try to populate using Excel functions. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that just like almost anything in Excel, there are a number of different ways to accomplish the same thing, and formulas are no exception. There's the lazy way, and there's the proper way. So let me show you the lazy way first. If I were a lazy person and I knew that I needed a function to return the year from my birth date column, I might go to the formulas tab in my ribbon. I might kind of browse through the formula library and say, all right, I need a date 
time related function and I'm looking for something that has to do with a year and there it is we've got a year function it's going to open up this dialog box and this is basically Excel holding my hand through the arguments of the year function it's going to say give me a serial number in this case a date and I can click the picker and say, all right, my birth date lives right there in cell F2. Looks good. Press OK. And there you go. It evaluated properly. There's nothing incorrect or wrong about that. Um, it just wrote the formula for me. It's kind of like training wheels or crutches. Um, I'm not actually learning the function as I'm doing this. I'm kind of relying on Excel to walk me through it. And you can actually get there a similar way using the insert function option here. Uh, where you can browse through the different categories. You can search for something like year. And then when you click on the function name, there we go back to the same dialog box. And from now on, we will never use that approach again. So instead of using the training wheel approach, what I'm going to do is teach you the proper way to learn functions, which is actually understanding the building blocks, writing them from scratch, and becoming fluent in Excel's formula language. This is going to allow you to really understand how Excel works and more importantly, how it thinks. So let's go ahead and populate the birth years in column G by writing our own formula from scratch. And in this case, it's a simple one. We're going to use the year function, open up the parenthesis to see that, okay, we've got one argument here. It's required and it's the serial number, which is the date value that we want to extract the year from. So I can arrow over or just click on F2, close the parenthesis, and that's literally all I need to do. Press enter, and there we go. It's extract from the birth date in cell F2. Now I'm obviously not going to write the same function. There are a few ways that I can apply this formula down. I can either copy and paste. I can drag the lower corner and pull it down. But my favorite approach is to hover over that lower right corner and simply double click to autofill or shoot that formula all the way down through the rest of the column. So there you have it. We've got our birth years with a very simple single argument function. Let's move on to area code, which we're going to define as the first three digits of our telephone number. So for that, we're going to use a text function called left, and we're going to cover this in the text section of the course. But now when I open up the parenthesis, you'll see two arguments one required called text and one optional called number of characters. So we want to extract some characters from the text in cell H2. And if we were just to close that off, we can see what the default behavior is for that optional number of characters option. And you'll see that it just returns the first character from that phone number, which is not what we want here. So we can go back to our first instance of the formula. You can click into the formula bar or double click the cell to edit and just navigate right back after that text argument, add the comma to proceed to our second argument. And here where we need the number of characters, all we're going to do is type a three and press enter. So there we go. Double click to shoot it down and we get the proper responses. Looks good. Now this last example is going to get a little bit more complicated. Don't worry if you have a little bit of a hard time following along. We're going to revisit this example in depth in the text section of the course. But in this case, I want to show you how formulas can get a bit more complex and a bit more advanced. So for username, we're going to define the username as everything before the at sign in the email address. So just like our last example, we're going to start with a left function. And we want to return some characters from the left of the text in this case in J2. And now check this out for the number of characters argument. We can't just type something concrete in here. We can't type five or eight because it might be correct for the first row, but it won't be correct for all of the others. So when you arrive at cases like this, where you need something a bit more sophisticated, a bit more dynamic, what you'll often need to do is nest functions within the arguments of other functions. And that's exactly what we would need to do here. And in this case, I'm going to tell Excel, hey, we need to search for the at sign and we're going to look for it within this text in J2. And that's going to tell me the number of character, the position of that at sign within that string. And then because I want to return all the characters just before that at sign, 
I'm going to subtract one, and that is going to define the number of characters argument in my left function. So I can close off my last parenthesis, press enter, I get the proper answer for row two, and there we go. It persists, it looks accurate, all the way down through row. So again, don't worry about the specific usage of left and search here. Just remember that we're dealing with formula arguments and we're nesting functions within them to do more complex things. So there you have it. Hopefully that was a helpful primer on formula syntax.